that better? Brilliant. Okay. Okay, as I said, I'm Sandra Gray from the National Bee Unit. Um, brief history. Basically, it wasn't until the 1940s that the government first became involved with the beekeeping industry. This was due to the sugar ration. And the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries decided to regulate the sugar position because of wartime rationing. There, there is a story that goes back to Winston Churchill, who actually liked honey. And it was a case that he didn't get honey one year on his porridge and he asked why. And he says, well, the beekeepers can um, no longer take all the honey off because they've got no sugar to put back. And it was agreed that the beekeepers have um, the sugar as part of their ration. Then in 1942, there was the foul brood disease of bees order. And in 1950s, the National Agricultural Advisory Service at Rothamsted was responsible for bee health. Then in 1979, the Agricultural Development Advisory Service and National Bee Unit was formed at Luddington. And it was in 1996 that the National Bee Unit, as became known then, moved to York. As of October the 1st, 2014, I can't see my screen. Um, it was 2014 that we became part of Animal Plant Health Agency. The National Bee Inspectorate became part with the Plant Health Seed Inspectorate and the GM Inspectorate was one agency. Now, at that time, we were part of the National Bee Unit. We had the National Bee Unit Laboratory. The National Bee Unit Laboratory went over to Ferra Science Limited, which is a part government, part private enterprise. Now, this is what I think most of the clientele have of their view of the NBU Inspectorate. And I'm hoping that in the next 30 to 40 minutes, I can convince you that we are not like this at all. Okay. The National Bee Unit coverage. This was up till this year. We had um, the regions were divided into North, Northeast, Eastern, Western, Southern, Southeast, Southwest, and Wales. But you are the first to know that we have now changed the regions and they are more formed into this type of district. We've got the Northwest, Northeast, Central, Western, Western, Eastern, Southeast, Southwest, and Wales. Um, what's happened is the line has gone up the M1 to divide the county at the top. As you can see, Northern encroached onto the Northeast. So after several years, it's now been decided that it is divided that way. And you can see the inspectors where they live are then better placed. Now, as with football teams, the MBU also has management changes. Most of you will know that Paul Lambert has gone and Paul Cook has arrived at Ipswich Town. I will not talk about the latest takeover because that was the, the latest buyout, which was on Thursday. I haven't got enough information to convey that all to you. But with the National Bee Unit, we have management changes as well. Mike Brown, a stalwart of the National Bee Unit, left in 2019. The head of the National Bee Unit now is Julian Parker. The National Bee Inspector is Christina Ruiz Martin. And the Bee Base Manager is a temporary position at the moment, is Adam Parker. Um, most of you will know that Kate Wilson was part of the Bee Base team has moved over to Pastures New temporarily. That's the temporary position at the moment for Adam. The Healthy Bees Plan Project Manager is Rebecca Clarkson, and the Contingency Planning and Science Officer is Nigel Simmons. These are what we call the NBU Office. Now we come on to the Regional Bee Inspectors. We have Mark McLaughlin in the Northwest, Don Atkinson in the Northeast, Keith Morgan in the Eastern, Western is Colin Pavey, Southwest Simon Jones, Central is Peter Davis, and myself in the Southeast. Roger did point out that yes, I cover Southeast, but I'm only about 40 minutes away from the M25. So the Southeast is covered from the M25. Ferris Science List Limited is made up of the research scientist Victoria Tompkins. The Assistant Science Bee Health is Daniela Brooks. She was appointed in March 21. 
most of you, if you've gone to any National B Unit um, events or talks, will know that Kirsty Stainton was the stalwart on, uh, for, in Ferris Science. And she has done two B Base Ferris Science videos on B Base regarding the Asian Hornet biology and Asian Hornet genetics video. She has since left and gone to Purbrook um, and is studying there and working there at the moment. Ferris Science works in the background. They are the diagnostics team. When a bee inspector comes out to you, and if you, are, if you have a um, diagnosis of fowl brood, they will take an LFD test. It is the Ferris Science Department, the Ferris Science Limit, that send out the notice to you to confirm that you have got European or American fowl brood. The the suppressé of the role of the regional the inspectors and the seasonal the inspectors. Every job, as you know, has big job descriptions. But I think this is information that will be quite of use to you and it's interesting to know. Basically, we control serious and endemic pests and diseases. We help to advise beekeepers on the recognition and control of pests and diseases. It's actually to make the industry, the beekeeping industry, more self-sufficient. We need to minimise the risk of importation of exotic pests and diseases and manage the risks should a serious exotic organisms be discovered. That is part of our work in terms of what we call nowadays contingency work. If an exotic pest or disease came in, then we would have to work on a contingency level to contain it and erase it. We engage and work with bee farmers in respect to the disease assurance scheme for honeybees. This is known as DASH. That's another subject altogether that could take up a whole evening. But I think it's worth knowing about that we have this accredited, this insurance scheme for bee farmers. We undertake the baseline inspections of all the colonies and we audit expansions every three years. We also maintain specified records in connection with legislative inspection work, the standards required of the police and criminal investment Act, and its associated codes of practice. In other words, um, if there is a break in terms of what the beekeeper has done in terms of the statutory code of practice, we have written it down and we do proceed with the legal department in DEFRA. A seasonal bee inspector and a regional bee inspector have to obtain a City and Guilds Level 2 Bee Health Management and Safe Use of Veterinary Medicines after a period of service. The NBU Inspectorate, the National Bee Union Inspectorate, works to the ISO 1720 NBU fowl brood inspections and treatment standard. I've mentioned the city and guilds level, but we also all work to an ISO 1720. It's an internationally recognized standard setting requirements for the competence of organizations performing inspections and the impartiality and consistency of their inspection activities. So each year, um, a new seasonal bee inspector will come on they will have a set piece of training to undergo. And in their second year, they will be ISO assessed either externally or internally by the regional bee inspector or an external inspector will inspect the regional bee inspector and the seasonal bee inspector. So some poor <laughs> beekeeper will be phoned up, but will be told that we will be doing an ISO inspection. So, they will be aware of how many people will be in their apiary watching their poor bees being looked at by one person and two people watching. Um, but it is a standard. It's an internationally recognised standard. And the National Bee Unit works to that in terms of fowl brood inspections. It also, we have to do the audit in terms of the office as well up at York. That has to be, all the paperwork has to be in place. Everything that we carry out has to be audited to that standard. Now, we work to a legislation. The National Bee Unit Legislation is related to the Bees Act 1980, the Bee Diseases and Pest Control England Order 2006. This means that the notified for diseases are European fowl brood and American fowl brood. And the notifiable pests are small hive beetle and tropilalapse mites. At this point, I will tell you, this um, talk is about the National Bee Unit Inspectorate. 
what we do, where we go, how we work. It is not about um, how you can know, um, find European fowl brood, how it's described. I will touch on it and show some pictures, but it's not, this talk is not about that. That would be another talk totally. Um, we're talking about how we work as an inspectorate. And I'm trying to convince you that we're not like that picture, that perception that you have of us. In terms of legislation of the Asian hornet, that is non-native, but it's on the list of invasive alien species of union concern. Some of my slides will relate to EU legislation. There is work going on in the background with policy and with government and with the EU for all this legislation to be changed and to be put under different acts. But at the moment, it is an invasive alien species. And member states, and including ourselves, have a surveillance system and take rapid eradication measures. We also work under consumer protection. We are contracted to take honey samples directly from beekeepers on behalf of the Veterinary Medicines Directorate. Um, this isn't always well known. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, the, bee, the beekeeper will think, oh, crikey, why are they taking the honey sample? What, what have I done wrong? It isn't anything that the beekeeper's done. We are contracted as a bee unit to do this. And in, nine, in 2020, we had 104 samples tested. Initially, we all know COVID-19 impacted on our lives last year. And this also affected the National Bee Unit. We had some inspectors who were shielding, some inspectors who couldn't go out, some inspectors who could go out. We decided that um, beekeeping is a work that can be done on your own. If the beekeeper had to be present, they obviously had to stay two meters away, but it became a problem in how we were going to take the honey sample. That is a lot of handling of items. The beekeeper themselves have to sign the paperwork. We now have a procedure put down, but obviously the six month program that we would have went through just to July and September. That still doesn't mean that we still, we still had 104 samples tested. One was tested positive for methylene, which is mothballs. We did investigate it. It was investigated and the second sample came up negative. So no further action was taken. But how it got there, we don't know. There is a suspect um, poisoning sample found in glyphosate, which is above the MRL in some honey. And with the uh, wildlife investigation, we are working with them and we're still reviewing it, what has happened, where it's come from. We do work with the DEFRA Wildlife Incident Investigation Scheme. What happens there is if a beekeeper reports that they think they've had a suspect poisoning, the seasonal bee inspector or the regional bee inspector will go along, have a look at the situation, and then decide whether or not it is worth investigating. The wildlife incident investigation will take notes, samples will be sent off, and then they take over the investigation. Right. Varroa. <laughs> I suspect some of you will have heard about this or have read about it. I will give you the legislation and the reasons why. Varroa is becoming reportable from the 21st of April. Right, the consignments of bees infestation with varroa mites is one of the listed diseases in Annex 1 to Commission deregulated delegated regulation and it is referred to in Article 5 of the regulation, the Animal Health Law and listed in Annex 2. To main continuity of trade with the EU and Northern Ireland, we have to maintain equivalent laws, rules. Some areas still have Varroa protector status, such as the Isle of Man and the Isle of Colonsey. Therefore, the P Diseases and Pest Control England Amendment Order will become Order 2021, and the same for Wales and Scotland. All this will come into force on the 21st of April. There will be notifications put out on BeeBase for the 21st of April. You will also be able to report Varroa onto BeeBase from the 21st of April. Okay. EU exit imports and exports. 
Only queens may now be imported or exported to from Great Britain. Packages, nucleus and colonies are no longer possible. This is not a policy change. This is a consequence of now becoming a third country. For importers, IPAS, the importer of products, animals, foods and feed system, now replaces the trade control and export system. For importers, the third country rules are all cages, attendant workers, packaging to be sent to FERA within five days. It is the responsibility of the importer named on the health certificate to do this. Not the seasonal bee inspector's responsibility. It is not the subsequent purchaser of the bees. It is the importer named on the health certificate. Right, notifiable diseases under the UK legislation. American fowl brood, which is the picture on the right. Ropey, European fowl brood on the bottom. The exotic pests are small hive beetle and tropi laylaps. Small hive beetle. This is a quick life cycle. I put this in because I think just to remind people of the maggots and the little bat beetle, the antennae. And tropi laylaps which is an elongated like Varroa. Bee base. This is a web enabled database. It has information about us, the National Bee Unit, legislation, pests and diseases, including their recognition and control. Beekeepers can register on online and view their own apiary records, diagnostic histories and details, e-learning and alerts from the National Bee Unit. It was good to know that 77% of the people listening are registered on BeeBase. Registration for beekeepers is not compulsory. So how do we know where to go? When fowl brood is notified, the, L the LFD from the bee inspector is sent up to Ferris Science. At that point, it is then put on to BeeBase and beekeepers within three kilometres will be notified that there is foul brood in their area. At no point is the beekeeper who has the foul brood or the area or the person who has the foul brood in their bees is given. It is part of the data protection. We do not notify any person who has got foul brood. That is not what we do. At this point, the seasonal bee inspector will have a list and the list will be altered of those beekeepers in the area, but it's only those beekeepers who are registered who will be notified. Very often we go out to areas, we make a phone call, we say we need to come and look at your bees, there is foul brood in the area. We are working under legislation, that is our job. We go there and someone will say, oh, did you know so-and-so over the fence has got foul brood? But the main thing is we need to find out the source in the past, it has been from swarms. In the past, it has been from beekeepers who have not been registered. If, for example, small hive beetle came into the country, knowing what beekeepers are in the area helps us in the National Bee Unit to eradicate it and also notify people and to be able to have a, you know, a complete community working with us. As we said, registration is not compulsory, but there is a lot of information on BeeBase. BeeBase is actually being updated at the moment with the information. And there is a lot of e-learning projects that are coming forward, as well as you getting alerts from us. Now, these are the numbers that are registered. These are what we know about. So in England, you can see at the present time, in fact, it was this afternoon, took the figures, there's 38,365 beekeepers. That's 51,358 apiaries, 187,822 colonies. And with Wales, 3,664, apiaries of 5,193, and a number of colonies of 22,818. And there's only 60 of us in the National Bee Unit. <laughs> Last year, 
you can see the bowel brood did increase. You can see that from the numbers, 629 cases of EFB and 473 in 2019. The same with American fowl brood. And the colonies that we visited, we visited 5,367 apiaries and inspected 31,867 colonies. We were key classed as key workers. We're part of biosecurity and part of the food chain. So all the seasonal inspectors who could work, who were allowed to go out and weren't shielded, did go out. Those who weren't shielded, who, weren't, who were having to shield, actually worked on bee base and cleansed a lot of the beekeepers who were no longer either keeping bees or unfortunately who had died. But you can see there's only 60 of us and how many aprons there are in the country compared to how many we inspected. Again, we treated 113 aprons. That was 192 colonies. And we had destructions at 260 aprons, which was 500 colonies destroyed. Now, that's what we can sometimes face up to. <laughs> These are some of the challenges we have. We can see a lot of wild comb and Heights. And as a five foot, five foot one inch woman going out to a field in the back of beyond with that many supers, I often when I first started, I used to carry a milk crate in the car, but then we suddenly had manual handling training and I no longer have my milk crate in the car. <laughs> but it's amazing what we can find out there. Um, the bees don't care. They, you know, they're still foraging, they're still looking, but you can see some of the equipment that's been left and the bees are quite happy, but if it's in an area of fowl brood within three kilometers, we do have to go through that comb to make sure. And then we have some destruction challenges. As you can see, a gas pipeline right by the colonies that we inspected once. So all those um, fowl brood, combs were packed up and sent to Weybridge, which is part of the incineration. There's been a lot of talk about the National Bee Unit becoming part of the Animal Plant Health Agency. Yes, we were taking, you know, we're now, we are a small cop in a big wheel, but that has also meant advantages for us. Like, for example, the incineration. There's an incineration department at Weybridge is now available to us. And that includes polystyrene hives that we find if they have to be destroyed. They can go to the incineration plant. It has also meant that the seasonal bee inspectors um, now have an opportunity to work winter times with the plant health seed inspectorate. I myself had advantage of that and I was trained up as an imports inspector at Stansted. That had cross what I call cross pollination, I was able to talk to them about small hive beetle. Plants came in from southern Italy and also um, we were able to talk about other insects like tropilelaps. But at the same time, there was a lot more recognition of what we could do and they found out what a bee inspector does and we found out what a plant health inspector does. And as you can see, we do often have burn-ups. Now, the ideal cars for a bee inspector. This is our wish list. When I first started, we had maps. And sometimes if somebody got the grid reference wrong, we couldn't find where the apiary is. Now we have our magical phones with GPS, and we can have photos, and we can take, we know, with satellites of Google Maps. We don't have to fly over fields with chitty chitty bang bang. Then of course we'd like the digger sometimes it's very difficult when you have to do destructions. And then there's the fire engine in case the fire or the flamethrower gets out of control. But unfortunately all I have is a 15 year old RAV4 which gets loaded up each time when it comes out to visit you. We do healthy bee days, apiary safaris, honey shows and beekeeper events. 
as you can see, National Honey Show. And also at a Bibber talk a couple of years ago, we did a stand in Kent. But the last year, obviously, these events have had to be curtailed. But it is a big part of the work that we do is educating. We I come out, the April safaris, the Bee Health Days, they are all part of you getting to know us and us getting to know you. We are looking this year at doing these virtually, even if we can't bring um, diseased cones along and show you face to face. But we are looking this year as a national bee unit, as the inspectorate, at doing this virtually. So you can still find out what we do and we can still help you diagnose and call us. Going on to imports, this is controversial. I am just giving the figures. The imports last year, we had 6.5% prawns and 19% packages. You can see on bee base, the figures are there for you to see where they've come from. This is the packages and they come in. We have to be there to not watch them be decanted. Here we have the packages and we have Tom sitting in London with all these queen cages, checking every single one with his little magic torch. For EU, coming from the EU, it's 25% of the imports. From Italy, we have to inspect 50%. Now, onto the Asian hornet. As I mentioned at the first, it doesn't come under the Bees Act, but it comes under the non-native and species species. You all know what an Asian hornet looks like. These are just photographs to remind you of the yellow legs and the gold abdomen at the back. And this photograph of it hawking on a honeybee. We have it feeding. This is uh, what we call a primary nest. And this is the secondary nest up in the tree. This was found down in um, Hampshire two years ago. This is the bee inspector stood on it. That's how we found it. And the secondary nest up at the top in the fir tree. Last year, there was only one incursion, thankfully. Could be you due to the traffic, less people coming across from the continent, less movement of traffic. We had the one incursion and we've managed to it was actually found, it was a non-beekeeper and it was on their crop of grapes. It was reported on the 6th of September. On the 7th, two inspectors were deployed and the specimen that he caught was collected. On the 8th, and 8th of September, it was seen flying at two sites. And on the 9th, five inspectors commenced the track and trace. It was found on the 11th of September and it destroyed at dusk on the 12th. Now, this is part of our work now, towards the end of the season. Um, the pictures come in, it's decided, we usually phone up to check, we ask for photographs, the inspector will go out and look. Last year, due to COVID, there was a lot more strict regulations. The inspectors working on the ground, the five inspectors had to make sure they stayed two meters apart. If they didn't, then we would put them into bubbles. We did not um, swap inspectors around. They stayed in what we call a bubble. They then worked and it was found actually on the estate. So then we had the worry last year of um, the public. Once they saw the um, people coming in these big massive suits, the wildlife team come and kill it in the evening. Um, I actually phoned up the Hampshire police <laughs> in Gosport. And I said, there could be a lot of people coming around. There could be congregations. I just want you to know. And they said, is there a threat to life? And I said, well, I suppose in terms of percentages, there isn't. Oh, well, we're not interested. So <laughs> I thought, well, I have let you know if something does happen, you know, but the police have got a lot of work on. They're not going to be interested. But it is important to let you know that everything was done under COVID guidelines. We still have to work under COVID guidelines this season when we come out. 
we will be coming asking to come out and visit inspectors but we would ask that the inspector the beekeeper is not there unless it's absolutely necessary. It was then, it was destroyed at dusk and then it was removed the next day. It was only a single nest and it was in an apple tree. There was no drones, no queens. It was an immature nest. So that was a good result. Now, I hope after all this, that you now have a better perception of what the National Bee Unit is and understand us a little bit better. And thank you for listening. Oh, thanks, Sandra. I hope that's all right. I didn't know how long to go on for, but... Um... Yeah, if you... Uh, I doubt if anyone will want to go back so perhaps if you uh, stop sharing your screen yep <coughs> i've got a few questions but um okay. I, i've answered some of them oh right <laughs> um one is an obvious one uh every colony colony in the uk will have varroa that's not strictly true but anyway most of us have yeah i don't understand what the rationale is for having to report this so can you go through that again please yeah it's to do with the animal health law when we left the eu it was reportable <clears throat> but it's now being made into legislation when it first came into the uk it's under the animal health law it was led it was reportable but um now because we've left the eu in order to export these we have to say if it's not you know that it's it's there it has to be notified Right. OK, there's one that I did um, partly answer. Yeah. I was asked if there were any qualifications required for uh, to be a bee inspector. Right. That, that comes. Well, yeah, that comes the answer. So you probably not, perhaps you can answer both at the same time. Yeah. The, Th if you... Thanks. Thanks for answering, Roger. So <laughs> on that basis, are they actually selected for the job if there is no qualifications? Uh, they, they have to have done a minimum of five years beekeeping. <clears throat> And um, there is actually some vacancies coming up now at the moment in actually in the southeast, South Kent and East Sussex, also um, in southwest in Devon and possibly one in Wales. Um, you have to have had five years beekeeping experience in order to apply. And what happens is um, if you passed, uh, passed the, the, what we call the SIFT, you get through to an interview. You then have a pest and diseases um, assessment in that you are given pictures and you have to pass that before you can go on to the interview. You are then, if you do pass that, you will have an interview on technical questions like your varroa sites and your information of how what you know about your bees. Then you are assessed in an apiary. Normally, all this takes place in York, but last year when we took on some bee inspectors, we actually, um, it obviously had to be done virtually. And the interview was done on um, Microsoft Teams. And then we would go to their apiary and we would assess them handling their own bees. Right, okay. Um, this one is really um, one question which you probably wouldn't want to answer. <laughs> and, well, try and, me and I can say yes or no. <laughs> and, and, and two statements. Uh, okay. Do you think the law should be changed to make it a legal requirement to register on bee base? That's, that's mm -hmm. the first bit. Yeah. Uh, on the Isle of Man, it is a legal requirement to report any movement of your bees within mm -hmm. seven days. Mm -hmm. And locally, and it doesn't say where the questioner lives, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think on the Isle of Man. <laughs> uh, locally, we had an EFB outbreak brought into the area by someone who did not show the movements of their bees mm. into that area. So mm. uh, basically, it's, it's really questions about um, uh, registration, really. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that. And there is, it is, it is something that has been discussed. It's discussed all the time. It is not up to us. It's policy. It's government policy that would decide whether or not um, beekeepers are registered. It's to do with, um, basically, I suppose people might think that they go underground. It's out of our hands. It is government policy um, and with regards movement of bees that's to do with a lot of people who move on to pollination 
And that's where the DASH scheme comes in. Um, the bee farmers who are on that, they will have, you know, they will have on bee base. We will know where their pollination sites are. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's only so much more we can do because there's only 50 or 60 of us out there in the country with beekeepers. Um, but I understand where you're coming from with the registration, but it is not, it is not government policy at the moment. No. Um, some of the countries I've been involved with, um, they, uh, the, there's nowhere near 100% um, registration mm. anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, people just ignore it. <clears throat> yeah. um, what is the inspectorate's contingency plan for feral colonies if small hive beetle is found in an area? Oh, <laughs> that's well, not you, to see you, you did... inspector on the line giving me these questions, is it? <laughs> Yeah, you, <laughs> you you did suggest you wanted a few challenges. Oh, right. OK. If it's a feral colony, um, everything will be um, destroyed. And there is um, it's I've forgotten, there's a chemical and I can't remember what the name of it is. I have to admit that um, that is put into the ground in the area where small hive beetle is found. And that is um, put into that area to kill any maggots or any um, hibernating beetles around in that area. If it's a feral colony, it would be destroyed. Yeah, well, they can actually fly several miles, can't they? They can. This is yeah. the problem. It's a, it would be in a, a zone, like they have in Italy. They've got all the zones set out. So that would be a case then of, you know, you, I... I it could be that, you know, we would have to know where the beekeepers are in that area. That's something that we would have to know. And it's not always beekeepers who tell us about feral colonies. It's members of the public. Yeah. Uh, do you incinerate all polyhives if AFB is confirmed? If AFB is, yes. If American fowl brood is. If um, it's a European fowl brood, then it is cleaned in a concentration of um, bleach. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Does the beekeeper need to accompany the inspector? No, they don't. Um, we are, um, if it's, if there is foul brood in an area and there are beehives on the land that nobody knows who belongs, it belongs to, we would actually leave a note first of all on the beehive saying that we would like to inspect your colonies. The bee inspector needs the authorization of the landowner. If the bees on the land are not the land of the beekeeper, as long as we have the authorization of the landowner, we can enter that, those, that apiary and check the bees. But that is not our first port of, um, what's well, not port of call, but our first action. We would try to make contact with the owner of the hives before we did that but we don't have to have the beekeeper there. Uh, we, as a bee inspector myself, when I go out, if it's a first time beekeeper and they've not, and they've only just got registered, they've only just got bees, I always like to make sure that the beekeeper is there so we can talk about things about um, varroa sides, what to look for in a colony, and if they've got any questions, and to let them know that we are that, we are not that um, with the scythe coming along all the time because I think sometimes people hear about the beans and oh, I've had the bee inspector I've had foul brood they've destroyed them but you know we are working to legislation but that is not our only piece of work we do a lot of other work in terms of healthy bee days and you know it's getting contact we're at the end of the day the bee inspectors are beekeepers themselves Right. If a large percentage of beekeepers register for Roa, in practical terms, A, what will MBU do with the information? B, how will this impact exports? Why oh, exports? Um, exports. They won't be able to export, I don't think, if there's um, Roa. That's something I need to clarify. That is all being worked out at the moment. But if um, when a bee inspector, if anybody's had an, um, a visit from a bee inspector, there is a box that we tick on the form if we see Varroa present. We have already been doing that on bee base. And if people, after a bee inspector has been to visit, they can look at their records. They can see what we have recorded and what we've written down. 
So we have been doing that anyway when we've been visiting. That's why the base is going to be adapted quite easily for um, the for registering of Baroa. Right, I'm putting two questions from the same person here together. <laughs> uh, well, they are relevant, actually. Yeah. Uh, for, first question is, can you explain how imported packages of bees are inspected for small hive beetle? Okay. What is the likelihood of small hive beetle being introduced into the country in the next five years? Mm. And the follow-up question is, on average... How long does it take to inspect a package of bees? Well, you better take the last one first because that's um, <laughs> that probably well, easier to get out of the way, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, the package, average package, it does take a lot of work. The beekeeper does have to be present because what we're doing is we're decanting them into, um, into a, a hive. The bee inspector likes, it's preferable for us to be there when you, well, we're not going to be doing it now anymore, but when we have previously, had packages in. The bees are decanted into the, into the hive. We watch for anything that is running across the top of the uh, frames or anything running around inside in the package. Everything that is in the package, like all the debris, propolis, debris, bee poo, food, whatever, wings, all that is scraped into an envelope and it is sent off to ferroscience for checking if there's any sign of small hive beetle. They put it through a diagnostic system. So um, that would pick up if there was anything in there from a small hive beetle. Um, it's a very big question about the next five years. Um, as we've seen with the Asian hornet this year, after COVID-19, there has been less movement across from the English Channel, across um, Europe itself. Um, and even, you know, you can't say we would never, we could have it within five years, we could have it within 10 years, we could not have it. I don't have a crystal ball, but all I can say is the National Bee Unit is doing its utmost to make sure that it doesn't get in to the UK. Right, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> what else, you know, to me, you, you, you you know, there's no, the only thing that can be imported now are queens with third country rules. Yeah. So those cages from the queens have to go straight to, to ferroscience. They can't, it's got to be inspected at the point before they go on to the next, to the purchaser or, you know, put into a colony. Right. Okay. Reduce, reducing the risk by importation of queens only. Hmm. Um. This one here, I'm, I'm trying to put about three uh, questions uh, together. Can you talk a little about the protocol from Northern Ireland with the importation of colonies? Oh. So that, that... Well... Uh, look, 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 Sandra, you, you want a challenge. You, you <laughs> and I'm, I'm doing my best to find them for you. You're if doing you're... a really good job, Roger. <laughs> It, honestly, if you feel uncomfortable about this, um, uh, then, I, then you've got to I decline. cannot speak on behalf of... Um, le legislation is that we all know the legislation. You cannot um, use Northern Ireland as a way of getting any item imported into the UK. And Customs and Excise will be looking at this and will be looking at businesses. And that is out of my hands. I've got one here that uh, that you, you you're going to embarrass you, but I'll tell you anyway because I actually Thank agree you. with it. I oh. always found my bee inspector as a really good source of help and support, oh. and an excellent service. Oh, thank you. I am embarrassed. That's lovely to hear. Yeah, we do. We don't just. It's what I was trying to say. We don't just pick on people. It's done by if it if foul brood is found, it's. Under legislation, we then get told, you know, the bee base tells us which beekeepers are there and we're coming out to help you. We're not picking on you. Sometimes when I first started, <laughs> I used to have beekeepers say, well, why are you picking? Why have I come out? I said, but 
we can start off the season, we could start this week with um, beekeeper A getting a phone call, but by the end of May, that beekeeper A would probably be bottom of the list because others, Valbrook might have been picked up in other areas. It's altered all the time. It's a moving time, you know, a moving beast, as they say. Yeah. Well, this is quite an interesting one. What, what's the penalty for not registering Varroa from the 22nd of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, They're going to bring back hanging. Oh, I shall take that to the new head of the B unit, Julian Parker. I shall ask him on Monday, <laughs> what is the penalty? <laughs> Well, it, yeah, it, 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 it's something we've got to think about. But I, as I said, I think we ought to bring back hang, hanging. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like that one. I haven't, I haven't, we actually, we've not been asked that one. Yeah. Uh, this one I can give you a bit of help on if you'd like. But I'll oh. give you, it was, it's your, uh, it, it, your, your answering. Realistically, is it inevitable that we will get small hive beetle and how big a problem is it going to be? <laughs> oh, well, they still haven't eradicated it in Italy. Um, it's not inevitable. Um, nothing is inevitable. Um, foul brood and varroa is still a big killer of honeybees. Um, it's like we talk about the Asian hornet. Yes, it predates on honeybees. But you look at those figures that we had for fowl brood last year, you know, an American fowl brood and varroa are still big problems. Um, small hive beetle, I'm not belittling it. It is an enormous problem. Yeah. Um, it's going to challenge us as it challenges in the States, but they have found with beetle blasters and uh, monitoring, we, we keep going through all these challenges. Varroa was the biggest challenge. Then when we had the um, when we had the resistance to py the pyrethroids, we all thought we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to control varroa. We have overcome it. Um, it's a difficult one. It is. I don't say it's inevitable we'll get it. There is the chance we could get it. It's. It, it will be if we if you think it's inevitable. Yeah, yeah. I've actually sent small hive beetle in the states, and oh, right. I can I can tell people. We definitely do want it. If you have seen a frame of honey absolutely wriggling with maggots, mm. that's what I saw. Mm. And um, as I understand, I've never seen tropilalaps. As I understand yeah. it, far, far worse than varroa. Yeah. Far worse. Mm. And the thing is with tropilalaps, um, it's a quarter of the size of area-wise, a quarter of the size of varroa. Yeah. An awful lot of beekeepers can't even see queens that are a lot bigger than that. <laughs> the, yeah, the thing is, it will change. Small hive beetle will change. We won't be able to leave frames. You won't be able to leave your frames of honey ready for extracting in November. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to move it out of the way, out of the house. You're going to have to make sure everything's sealed. It is, it's a frightening problem. When um, I first became a seasonal bee inspector and I, we had a lot more education about small hive beetle. Um, all of us said, well, that's just, but that was 11 years ago. And, you know, you, it is frightening, but it is being aware of it and learning how to, how it works and how to adapt. Do we know why EFB is on the rise? Especially interesting as BBKA has notified its presence in Bristol I suspect they mean the uh, NBU, but anyway. Yeah, there has uh, the NBU has um yes Bristol Western region. Yeah, Bristol. Yeah, it. We we're all talking about it. Um, but there there was a lot we couldn't work out whether it was because we were getting more inspections in and we were seeing, but we were finding a lot more foul brood. And Keith Morgan, the Eastern Regional Bee Inspector, was actually finding um that the it wasn't typical EFB. It wasn't sitting like it was. It's like a, it's a different type. Every time you, um, if we find foul brood, every time we take the LFD, the lateral flow device, and we also take up, goes up to ferroscience, the, um, we put the larvae into the bottle, shake it, and then put the pipette onto the lateral flow device. The larvae and everything goes up to ferroscience and they sequence it. And we know um, the sequencing 
of the fowl brood. So we can see on a map at the end of the season if there's been uh, where one particular European fowl brood is. And if it comes up in another part of the country, um, then we can see, and we, and we have done that in the Eastern region, there was a connection between one area and into Norfolk, from Cambridge into Norfolk. And it was actually a beekeeper who'd moved his bees. But there's also the common type of European fowl brood. But sometimes we can, if um, we get a different strain, you can see where it is and we can locate where it's come from. Right. But in terms of last year, I, we're still <laughs> looking at it and why. Uh, now, this person, I'm fairly certain is, is new to beekeeping, um, I think probably within two years. So the sort of questions that she's asking here, um, yeah. I think are probably quite um, uh, are quite appropriate to a, a lot of beginners. Okay. So I'll, 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 I'll go through, it's quite long. I Sorry. just res registered my apiary on a farm with bee base. Yeah. I only have two hives. Will an inspector come annually to the apiary to check? Shall I call him to come annually? Obviously, a male bee inspector in that area. Or shall I only continue, uh, contact him if the bees have a notifiable disease? Yeah. How already... much will the visit cost? <laughs> I'm asking because at my local association teaching apiary, an inspector comes yearly. I guess the last one is just a sort of courtesy um, yeah. Uh, visit. Yeah. Okay, so oh, there's, lo there's lots of questions in there, but the sort of things that... F yeah, that's a, fairly... that's, it's a good question. It's a very good question because um, we only you legally come out if you're in a notifiable area, okay? We have on our bee-based system a red, amber, green system. The ones that are in red are sites or apiaries that are within three kilometres of confirmed fowl brood. And the amber ones are within the five to 10 kilometres. So you could be in an area that is called green, where you've had no fowl brood um, for a long while and you're not within 10 kilometres. In that case, you would not get an inspection annually. It's um, if you're in the red ones where you're within three kilometres of confirmed fowl brood, um, you will know if you're registered on bee base you will get a notification that you have got there's confirmed foul brood in your area and a bee inspector will call you. Um, with regards to the apiary inspection, I would think it's because sometimes the seasonal bee inspectors or the regional bee inspectors go along to a BBK apiary and that's when they sort of like do an apiary safari or a talk or introduce, especially to beginners, let them know who the national bee unit are and what we stand for and why we go out. Um, with regards to payment, it's usually a cup of tea or a piece of cake. But um, obviously with COVID-19, that has now stopped. But um, I joke, you don't always have to give us a cup of tea and a piece of cake, but there is no payment. We are a government service. We're a public service. Uh, I think that answered the lab. Uh, a question here where would tropilolaps come in from it will come in from the um oh crikey uh salon oh it used to be salon sri lankan area from the um yeah it's, 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 uh, yeah it's the it's that sort of area it's actually on sometimes it can be on flowers uh, again when i was with the plant health seed inspector it was a thing we discussed with the flowers that coming from that area it's not your problem um, I don't know if it's yours or mine. Yeah, it's, it's mine, I think. Okay. Hang on. Yeah. It's Richard messing me about again, I think. Right. <laughs> you don't need my help to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's another one. I, I, I don't know this question, but uh, do you come out if a colony has chronic bee paralysis virus? Um, if very often a beekeeper will phone us and say, all oh, my bees have died. Um, if it's been like that, we would come out and look because we could decide, you know, we need to look and check if it's a poisoning or if it's chronic bee paralysis. So um, there has been a lot of cases of chronic bee paralysis um, and we were called out in the winter. A lot <laughs> of it was due to starvation. 
yeah. over the winter. Yeah. Um, because the some... regional bee inspector will still work from <coughs> September to April, and that will be the point of contact to the regional bee inspector. Uh, you can still call us in the winter if you have a problem. Right. Um, uh, this reminds me, um, there was a, uh, a point made earlier, oh, I forgot about it, point made earlier, the, uh, when the poll was put up, um, there were a lot of people from outside England and Wales, so your 70% isn't, yeah. isn't quite right because, uh, you know, it, yeah. it, 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 it may well be um, uh, quite different to that. Okay. Um, somebody here wants you to repeat what you said about the movement of colonies of Italian imports through the Northern Ireland. Oh, well, um, that's... Well, I, I, I think what they're after is the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the sort of protocol. The protocol, well, that's not a legal protocol to go through Northern Ireland. As a legislature, Northern Ireland is not to be used um, for whatever, whether it's bees, goods, or whatever. Um, that is out of my jurisdiction. Um, as far as I know, if bees go to Northern Ireland, they have to be inspected. Um, I am not, you know, it's it, in terms of legal, the agreement with Northern Ireland, the exit of the EU, that is up to customs and excise to look into, not the National Bee Union. Yeah. Um, one here and I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing why it's being asked. Um, if you have an apiary in an area with EFB, so it's presumably within kilometres. Would your other apiaries outside that area get inspected? Yes, they would, because um, you don't know whether you you may well have done a, um, a artificial swarm, taken some bees to another area. Um, so yes, if you have um, an apiary that's you get a phone call from the bee inspector, and it's within it's in the fowl brood area. You would have that inspected, and then the bee inspector would go out with all your other aprons, would visit every one of them with you mm. or without you at the moment, preferably because yeah. of COVID 19. Well, I don't know how you can answer this one, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> uh, th this is a question that's dear to the heart of BIMA members. What is yes. the NBU's position on AMM and the continued importation of non native genetics? Uh, we have no um, official line on it. Um, that's that is the official line. We have no official line. We can't. It's something that is discussed at the Bee Health Advisory Forum, which is a separate part um, of the that was set up with the BBKA and policy, government policy. <coughs> we have a seat on there, and I know it's discussed on there, but. In terms of policy, we have no way of saying we're impartial. Okay. Um, and this one I have to say I agree with because I've moaned about it in the past. Could I ask you to feed back to your web team that much of the text in the BBase site is very small and font stiffer? Okay. From a user point of view, this makes it difficult to use and may reduce beekeeper interaction with the site uh, actually i find it quite difficult to navigate as well yeah the, we have had a lot of questions i did say actually we've had um amongst this is going to become very jargon now amongst the national bee unit we have what we call um subgroups with you know the seasonal bee inspectors and the regional bee inspectors and one of the groups is working on the technical side of um bee base so we are actually working on that and how to navigate around and the information on there. You will find that there's quite a difference compared to last year. A lot of information has been revised or revamped and put in a different format. So yes, uh, with regards to font, I haven't had that before. So I shall take that forward to Julian on Monday, along with the other question about what's the fine if they don't- Oh, if it's Julian, we can find a lot more than that. <laughs> I've got two questions now. So, no, seriously, um, yes, the bee base is being what is being done up at the moment. Obviously, um, that's due to you know technical side of things. We've lost we lost Jason Lerner in the office. The office has the office staff has been reduced over the last five years drastically. 
Um, there's only Becky Clarkson now there and she's in the bee health advisory uh, capacity. So um, we've now got seasonal bee inspectors and regional bee inspectors working on bee beds. So I will take that forward about the font. Uh, yeah, we, we're getting to, uh, I think, fairly close to the end now. Uh, please, can you clarify this business of notifying Varroa? Will it affect a hobbyist with up to five hives not selling bees or queens? So basically what they're saying is if, you, if you're not selling bees or anything, we, we've all got to do it, have we? Yeah, it's yeah, exporting bees. It's not just selling bees, it's exporting. It is notifiable um, because of leaving the EU and the animal health law. Um, it's just being clarified. It's... It's out of our hands. It's something that has come up because of the change with the legislation since leaving the EU. Um, I don't know what the fine will be. It's a question I shall put forward, but we will make it, if a bee inspector comes to the apiary, we still, we've always ticked a box when we've seen Varroa. It depends on how bad the Varroa is, what box we tick. Um, it's just that we are going to have to comply with legislation and we're making it um, easy on bee base for, for beekeepers to report that they've got Varroa. Is disease spread via contact with tools or bee suits something that is proved or just supposed? Um, it, it, this is going back, it is tools, your hive tools and everything should always be cleaned between each hive. And you be, it, there was at one time uh, a few years ago they did do swabs of um, a car that had had someone had had uh, foul brood and bee suits and everything and they found the swabs they found the um, um, spores not the spores the uh, bacteria actually still in the car from EFB it was something that we did as an experiment so all bee inspectors you'll notice will have disinfectant, they'll clean their hive tools between inspections, they will have a mat in the back of the car, and that will be cleaned each time. Um, so yes, it has been proven that it can live, it can be on equipment, and it can be on clothing. Yeah, so is disease spread though? What, that, was, that was the question. Yeah, is this yeah. Yeah, in your own apiary, it can be. You take a hive tool, you don't clean it between you don't know that you've got foul brood in one of your colonies. Um, you're going through with your hive tool, take it through, touch it, then you go into the next colony, you're transmitting that bacteria or that spore to the next colony. You will always find a bee inspector will always clean their oh. tool between, a, between colonies. Yeah, okay, well that, that's pretty obvious why, because they, yeah. they, don't, they don't want to be uh, accused no. of spreading it. No, exactly. Uh, which, is, which is fair enough. Um, but I, I suspect the questioner is asking if there's any scientific proof, though. Just because it was found on a car doesn't necessarily mean it's got into another colony. Yeah, well, it's, it, it will go from another colony to a colony. It, it, okay, so it's been, yeah. been, been Sander proved. <laughs> uh, okay. Right, if AFB is found by the inspector, what all um, is destroyed, is there any compensation? Well, or, yeah, um, it depends where you are, doesn't it? <clears throat> yeah, there, <laughs> there's bee disease insurance. If you're a member of the BPKA, you will have your bee, dis bee disease insurance. That you And we, we're not loss adjusters, but we will write down for the BDI how many frames you lose, what colony, how many bees you lost, how many, um, if you had any other things that were destroyed because of AFB. Um, and there is a new, um, I, mean, I don't want to preempt the, what the BBKA are going to talk about next week, but there is going to be a shook swarm, the EFB whole apiary shook swarm, and they will receive insurance for that. Whereas before they didn't, they only got it for the colonies that were confirmed with foul brood. You mean BDI, not BBKA? BDI, yeah, yep, BDI. That's right. Yeah, but the um, BBKA convention next week will be talking about right. the new BDI insurance scheme. Well, as a as a a, a BDI um, director, I think I can jump in here as well. Go on, you um, can. Yeah, well, yeah, this actually only applies to 
uh, beekeeping associations that are members of BDI, Bee Diseases Insurance, in England and Wales. Okay. So if you're outside uh, England and Wales, then uh, then you won't um, won't get any compensation. Although there is a scheme in Scotland, I think, which is a compensationary scheme. Mm. And I think it's run by the Scottish Beekeepers Association. Mm. To the best of my knowledge, nothing in Ireland, uh, nothing in the Isle of Man, and apart from a Scottish beekeepers members, nothing in Scotland, I think. Um, somebody's asked, what do you clean the hive tool with? Soda crystals. Okay. Um, I think actually, Sandra, most of these have been asked in some way um, uh, or other. So okay. um, it just reminds me to thank you very much.